Ghost Hunting in New England, your favorite spooky podcast. Hello and happy Wednesday. Welcome to this week's episode of Ghost Hunting in New England with your hosts, Amelia. And Beth. And today we have a lot of fun stuff happening, but to begin, Beth, I am so excited that it's fall is here. I know it's Labor Day weekend. This is so terrific. I know. I feel like I need to like issue a public apology to all those people who decorate for Christmas like the day after Thanksgiving or like right before it. Because for years, I've been like, those people are insane. I, I couldn't understand it. But we're, we're recording this like before Labor Day, and I got pumpkin stuff on my table. I've already been to a cornfield. I have fall color nail polish on. It's a really fabulous color. Thank you. I am. And even when I got it done, the lady at the nail salon started laughing. She's like, oh, someone's ready for fall. I was like, sure am. All I so. want to hear is, good choice. Yeah, well, it's really, so, whatever. Right into the show, this is happening to you too. But in the Metro West area of Massachusetts, whenever I go to get my nails done, at four different places, this has happened in the last three years, four different places, I will pick out a color and they will tell me no and give me a different color because they say it will look better. Is it close to the one that you picked? No. Does it look better than the one you picked? No. Uh, So you don't go back to that place? Not usually. Yeah, I, I wouldn't go back there. I have a place. I have a place that I always go to, and they always do a fabulous job. And I and I went to that place, and they did do a fabulous job. But see? that's another time. Okay, yeah. so anyway, we're doing something really cool and interesting today, Beth. No. Yes, I thought we did really like lame, boring things on our podcast. Sometimes, but not this <laughs> time. So- <laughs> no, of course, our podcast is always fun, and it's always interesting. And look. There is someone in the waiting room ready to come in. Shall oh, wow. Yeah, let him in. Okay. So today we are so excited to bring on a guest. And that is Dave McCullough. And he is a Bigfoot hunter enthusiast. And so Dave has had a lifelong interest in Sasquatch. And starting in 2004, began actively going on expeditions. He was a member of the Northeast Sasquatch Researchers Association, the NESRA, and is currently a member of Squatchachusetts and the BFRO, Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. So, Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Nice to be here. So, Squatchachusetts is so cool. And when I met you guys before, you gave me so much swag. And I love it. And I have a Bigfoot Crossing um, sticker on my car now. And oh, everyone nice. comments on it. <laughs> yeah, that's a popular one. I love we, it, yes. We uh, run out of those stickers a lot. I believe it. Yeah. So why don't you start by telling us what got you into looking for Bigfoot? Well, I had an interest in it when I was a kid watching in search of and some of a lot of the 70s stuff. And then the Patterson film, after seeing the Patterson film, I got more and more interested. And then probably in the 90s when the Internet exploded, I, you were able to read reports, actual sighting reports. And it really opened my eyes to how how uh, widespread it is and common, actually. And, um, and there's still a lot of people that don't come forward. So imagine the, you know, the percentage. There's a lot of people that have seen it, but they're in denial. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to get laughed at. Yes. And uh so, yeah, I just started reading reports, got really hooked on it. And I saw um ads for the, I, I'm like, I want to get, I want to go out one of these things. So I went in the BFRO expedition in 2004 in um, New York, Whitehall, New York. And there's, there's a long history there from going way back, a lot, a lot of sightings up there. And so I went there, got my foot wet, and I really, really got home because I was actually out with people that do this. Sorry about the noise. That's okay. Live in the city, so I'd have to deal with that. Sorry. That's uh, so funny because I actually thought it sounded like a dirt bike. That's what it is. <laughs> Somebody drives a dirt bike by your house in the city? Yeah. 
awesome. And you can hear them going up the other street. And that's all they're doing is, it is what it is. Yeah. That's why Bigfoots oh. avoid people. Well, hopefully yes. they're wearing a helmet and they're safe. <laughs> Sorry. So 2004, you're in Whitehall, New York. Yep. Uh, went the next year following. Then I went up a few years on my own and had some really interesting experiences and, uh, was pretty convinced. I still haven't seen one with my eyes, but uh, we call it class A, but I've had four class B's, which, uh, vocalizations, any kind of stick breaking, stick tossing. Uh, we call them trees pushed over and you'll hear a tree shaking and it'll literally snap and slam into the ground. I've had that twice and two really good vocalizations. So four things have happened since, um, in all those years. So it's wow. not a high batting average, but it's still fun to get out. With. So when a tree snaps, that's exactly what it sounds like. It, it like down near the base of the tree, it just falls over on yeah. its own. Well, one of them we couldn't see it because it was, um, pitch dark out and it was probably. 20 yards in the trees next to us. But we heard it loud and clear. We heard the snap. Actually, you can hear the bending and the bowing. You can actually, I can't imitate it, but it's like, you can hear it kind of bending and cracking. And then it just, mm -hmm. a snap, and it uh, slams into the ground with a pretty hard force. And there's not too many other animals out there that, that can do that. And uh, Again, that's, that's what adds to the mystery. And, you're so close, but you get so far away from it. It's like right there. So my initial gut is I want to ask, like, why is Bigfoot knocking trees down? But I think we even need to start back further than that, which is what do you think the Sasquatch is? Well, that's a tough one. There's a lot of different theories on it. I think it's um, just an undiscovered more like us, actually. I think it's actually more of a humanoid being than it is a uh, animal. But it's got characteristics of both. And uh, it's, I think it's more of a person that lives like an animal. Lives out in, out in the wild and fends for itself. Because they've uh, had some really good recordings over the years. of You can actually hear it, hear them talking and communicating more than just grunts and Haulers, mostly they'll play the haulers or the screams. But, uh, there's actually recordings out there of them going back and forth talking. The Sierra sounds, I don't know if you ever heard of that, but those are from the seventies up in, uh, like Tahoe region. Uh, Sierras, up in the Sierras. And, um, they've been, they've been proven they weren't faked. They've been scrutinized by so many scientific and academics that they, they just can't debunk them. And they were actually going back and forth syllables, but a lot of people report that when they hear it. They call it samurai chatter or gibberish. And, uh, I don't want to sound funny, but if you listen to these recordings, there's actually quite a few from Canada that, uh, it's actually what it is. It's, uh, almost like a Shrek to me or a Hobbit. Just something that lives out there by itself, avoids people, and does everything it can to keep you away. Like the tree shaking, tree snapping, you know, rocks getting tossed towards you. They, they never hit you, but they'll throw them pretty close. Enough so, um, you just want to get out of there, and that's what they're doing. That's what kind of leads me to it being human and an animal by the intimidation. A lot of apes and primates. That's their prime stick throwing, rock throwing, banging on trees. That's uh, well, they just want you out of that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, is Bigfoot? Is it like limited to Northern America? Because you hear about it a lot in like um, the northern part of the United States. You yeah, hear about it in Bigfoot, Canada. Yeah, I think of like Montana. Idaho. Actually, like, it's yeah. um, pretty widespread through the country, uh, except for like the flat plain states. And if you look on maps or ge geographical maps where there's no forest, that's where there's no sightings. Like, is that a coincidence or well, the hoaxes don't want to go where there's no trees, you know? But actually, <laughs> it's a global phenomenon. 
it's all around the world. This ain't just here. It's China, Russia, the Alps, um, the Yeti, even some of the islands, uh, South America, they call it the Mapanguari, which means, you know, man of the woods is, um, I think something to that. Mm-hmm. They've even found, you ever hear of the, um, Indonesia, the Hobbit? They, uh, actually discovered a Hobbit person. They know it was like, just like a Bigfoot, but only three or four feet tall. But same thing, hairy, long with, arms. With the furry feet and everything? Like a Hobbit? Yep. Yep. When was this? Uh, Homo Florensis. I want to say, um, at least 10 years ago, I'm guessing it's a total guess, but it's been out for a while. And this was in Indonesia? Uh, Sumatra. Actually, it was in Sumatra. They call them over there, they call them the little people. That's pretty cool. I'll be, yeah. I'll, I'll be checking that out. I am like the world's biggest Hobbit fan. Yeah, and it's the same as here. People have seen them on their farms, um, running across the road, typical sightings. So it is, it is a global phenomenon. It's not just in North America. It's, um, they've actually come up with some really good videos in Russia in the last few years. They get some good videos. Uh, China, they have, they have people researching it out there now and they've had a long history. Just like here, um, uh, it goes back hundreds of thousands of years handed down in Native American. And, um, uh, they have totems, they have bas- baskets and you name it, they have a Sasquatch and they have totems that depict all the other animals, you know, bear, fish, whales, like, mm-hmm. They have all these different designs, so why would they have one that looks like a leans towards a hairy man or an ape, but which they call the hairy man? And there's over a hundred. There's hundreds of every different tribe or creed had a name for it, which all kind of resembles man of the woods, stone giants, stick it, uh, the stick people, stick Indians. There's just all over the country, all the different Native Americans had a name for it. They've found uh, cave paintings, the paintings, not paintings, but uh, drawings. Mm-hmm. Um, Interesting. That depict the man, the woman, and the, the small one. Uh, they've had the feet. If you look at a typical foot cast, it's the general shape of that. And then there's a small one. So it's 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 uh, to call it hoaxing. It would be a cult that started this hundreds of years ago, and they do this all over the world. So it's, that's when I really started thinking that there's got to be something to this. There's, I don't think it's a global conspiracy of uh, the greatest hoaxes in the world. And there's no way someone could pull off something like that for so long. And that's right. That, that, that's a really good point that how could it have been going on for, for centuries and centuries and some, yeah. and no, nobody's been able to step in and be like, yeah, no, this is nothing. Yeah. I know people that, um, their families have seen them for generations. They had, they just say, leave them alone. If you see it, don't go near it. Just, they don't want to bother you. Just don't go near them. Mm-hmm. That's when they will intimidate you and get you away. Like they kind of want to see you and interact with you, but don't get too close. And cause I know people that do have interactions with them on a regular basis, but they keep their distance. And this has taken years and years to build a relationship with the trust. They have, they usually have an area in the tree line where they call it the gifting stump or gifting rock. Mm-hmm. Well, they'll literally bring them stuff and sure enough, it'll be gone and there'll be something back in its place. It could be anything you'd find walking around through them, something that you'd recognize that don't belong here. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't even think there's just so golf balls, uh, baseballs and there's a guy that found them. He said there's not a field for 20 miles. <laughs> Where'd it come from? You know? Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of objects like that, marbles, they find a lot of marbles, rocks. Um, nothing, uh, usually what a person would leave is, um, I know a uh, few that have had peanut butter, the sticky buns, those are big. They say they like sweets. Hmm. They have a real sweet tooth. And uh, certain things they won't touch, though. But all the food they take and a guy put out bananas were the only thing it wouldn't touch. So the next time he did it, he actually put the bunch there and he peeled one open so that then they were gone. Interesting. In the the case, uh, a couple years ago in Kentucky, the guy that was leaving peanut butter had always 
find the job taken off, all the peanut butter gone, and the job put back on. Uh, so something with hands. And um, he actually did it this time with Nutella, a jar of Nutella. And it didn't know what to make of it, but it took the lid off, and it just stuck his fingers down straight in it, put the cap back on and left. So the guy was smart enough. He froze it. And he actually made a cast out of it. I wish I had it here to show you, but oh. it's an actual cast of three giant fingers sticking in the jug. Could barely get three fingers in it. But, um, th there really is a lot of evidence they, that they can, sure there's no body, but there's a lot of other physical evidence that, um, people can look at. It's legit and they just don't want to uh, share it with the world, I guess, right now or. You're not meant to know. You don't need to know. But right. Well, if if we compare it to the idea of, like, the UFO things that are going on right now, like, people have been talking for centuries about UFOs, and, you know, it's been, you know, officially, like, that's not a thing, and then all of a sudden, you know, in the last couple of months, like, oh, yeah, it's a thing. Like, oh, yeah. You know, yeah, so well, yeah. We'll, we'll just wait for the official, you know, report on Sasquatch. We know what's yeah. happening. My, like, one thing about the Sasquatch, where I'm like, okay, this doesn't make sense to me, is where do they go when they die? Like, do we find question. a skeleton, or... How come you're asking all my questions before I can ask them? I'm sorry. Um, I'm guessing they go deep in the brush, and they found structures, structures and mounds of heavy brush that it would take a lot of, a lot of people a long time to do. Um, they found mounds with giant skeletons in them uh, in Ohio and all different parts of the country, actually. That doesn't mean it's a Bigfoot. But they all went to the Smithsonian Institution and never saw the light of day, and then they just disappeared. So oh, uh, that that's a theory, too. But plus, we never, there's, there's no bones of anything you find out there. Everything gets picked apart by different animals that are eating on it. And... Mm -hmm. um, they had a uh, study they did, a full deer carcass freshly killed. They staked it down and put a time-lapse camera on it. And within 30 days, there wasn't a sign of it because there was just all these different critters coming in and eating on it, pulling mm -hmm. bones away, a lot of rodents gnawing on the bones. So it's just, I've never found the bone of anything out there. Not that I've gone out so much, but you would think in uh 16 years of doing this, uh, I'd find at least one bone of something, but I've, I've never seen a bear. I've seen a couple of moose, tons of deer, but I know they're out there. The bears are, there's bears all over Massachusetts, but the odds of seeing them are not good unless you're staked up in a chair and sitting and waiting for hours. <laughs> but, um. That's true. I never want to see a bear, so I'm yeah. that. <laughs> they're going to, they're going to see you a mile before, or smell you a mile before you even, they're long gone. Yeah, they, they, if you want to see a bear, just leave some food out while you're camping. You'll see a oh, bear. Oh, absolutely. Yep. We've done that. We'll have a, uh, an area where they will go. We'll put stuff away from the camp. You know, any extra stuff, anything you've cooked, fruit, watermelon, just to, if they go anywhere, they'll go with, over there. So you won't, don't ever keep it with you. It's a good tip. Okay, so tell us about Squatchachusetts. How did it start? What are you guys about? Because it, it seems fun. Like, all your shirts are very fun. It, oh, yeah. it just seems it like a lot of fun. We do. We have a lot of fun. My partner, John Woke, he's, uh, he kind of started it. He was established it eight years ago. It's been going strong. It seems like it's even picked up some steam. There's actually been some recent sightings out west of Mass. And... Um, it's just a group of like-minded people that joins up now. We have a lot of members on Facebook, but actual people that come out and go out. It's growing each year that someone new that wants to go out. and We always welcome people to go out with us. Um, I always tell people nine times out of ten, you're not going to hear or see anything. But it's that one time that you might be in the right place at the right time. If they feel like being a little friendly, they'll let you know they're there. But um, it's hit or miss. It's like a shot in the dark, just like fishing. You could fish all day and not catch a fish, but I just like the uh, the opportunity to try. Usually fail, but uh, the times it does happen, you get really like a chill. Your hair goes up in your arm, and your um, your adrenaline flows pretty good. 
and you get a little wired all night and you're like, wow, did you hear that? Because it is so rare. And as your adrenaline rushes and you're you're having the chills and the goosebumps and you know all of a sudden your fingers are all all twitchy. You oh yeah, you the camera that? out to get the picture of the thing, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I've heard from some people that have seen it. They the emotions uh, that have happened mm -hmm. is people literally wet themselves. Um, That's oh, you, embarrassing. Yeah, I've heard <laughs> that a lot from a lot of researchers actually that it was so close that you were so. You know, in your fight or flight. Yep. So I get the hell out of you know, this is something you've been looking for and calling in. Now it's right there. But your body just is gonna jolt and mm -hmm. you get, yeah, you get excited. So a lot of people have uh, ran, cried, a lot of people have nightmares. A lot of witnesses that weren't actually looking for it, uh get traumatized over it. And they go to a lot of these conferences though, it's it's therapeutic for them. Mm -hmm. To talk about it and be able to talk, they're not going to get laughed at. And um, I've seen so many people talk about it, and you can see them almost reliving it there. They have, they'll they say, I'll never forget it. Um, usually everyone will say it changed their life. They'll never look at the world the same way because there's something out there that's kind of like us. Big and fearsome but elusive and, you know, you can go anywhere tonight and bring it up. Nine times, nine out of ten people are going to laugh at you. Or, uh, you know, the typical, it's a guy in a suit, it's tabloid. So you right. get up. Yep. Like, and, and, and we don't pay any attention with, to those nine out of ten exactly. people. We go with the like-minded people who think that there are things going on out there that just because we haven't seen it with our own eyes, that, that can actually still exist. Exactly. Right. Yep. And what what is your group's kind of like end game with this? Are you hoping to get a photo? Do you want to prove it to the world? Do you just want to prove it to yourselves? We're not out to prove it to the world, but we think a lot of us have had ex have had experiences enough that we are drawing them in a little closer. I mean, you're not going to get them to come out and pose for you, and it's not there. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just the, the thrill of the chance of it when most people dismiss it it's the chance of you know what believing in or going and looking it's just having faith in something that you know i, I want to believe it like i said i've heard them i've seen trees snapped right in front of me but i haven't seen it so i can't say yes i saw one i i can't say that but i know people that have it that will say you know what once you do it changes your whole perspective and you're and i probably would stop doing it so, but a lot of people, especially in our group, it's the camaraderie of going out, camping, getting a fire going, mm -hmm. you know, just doing camping stuff, just doing stuff you do at camp and not out being, you know, with all this gear and high tech, right? you're not going to outspot it. So, past few years, we've been more trying to bring it in. And uh, I think it makes them more curious because you're not out there, you know, if you're not doing the... If you knock on a tree, sometimes we get a knock on our first knock, but that's it. Because they're going to know yours isn't them. And it's a human trying to play with me, so it shows over. All lights, you don't shine lights it, towards it. You kind of more, more people that I've had heard have had good action as you're kind of doing something else. They're not Bigfoot people. They're uh, playing music by the fire, singing, dancing. There's been a ton of reports of um, people I know that had in Virginia that had a lot of stuff happening. They noticed uh, it was only when the family would come over and the kids would run around the farm. So the kids playing and the noise, and they'd always have a sighting that night or well, that day. So, um, it actually come through their yard while there was people. It was in the winter, but kids out playing snowball fights. Uh, they had a horse and sleigh taking kids around the farm, and this thing went right full, right up through the middle and into the woods. So very fast, but if we wanted to, it could have just stayed hidden and gone the other way. I think sometimes they almost want to interact, but like, hey, look at me, I'm right here, and run right through. And, so I, stay, I, uh, I, I have like a slight theory that I just developed right now in the moment about that particular story. So the the Bigfoot would only come by when the kids were there and out in the yard playing. 
I wouldn't say only, but it seemed like that's what had the that's when they had the most activity. Okay. So and stuff, can, can we really determine if the Bigfoot is a, a male or a female? Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're both if you look at the Patterson film as a female, I don't know if you've seen it now with the modern enhancements, it's very detailed now and um you can see the breasts. You can see it okay. moving up and down and yeah, some people have reported it. They could tell it was a male. Some can tell it was obviously a woman. Okay. Well, like a woman. Well, and, so uh, then I wonder if this this one that went through the farm here is actually um, a mother Bigfoot who maybe lost her baby Bigfoot and is coming to, like, you know, just enjoys the children or a, yep. a more nefarious uh, interpretation could include was looking for an unattended child who they could have scooped up and yes. off with, So Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people have said that too. If it wanted to hurt me, it could have because I was right there. It was yep. 10 feet in front of them and, which is very traumatic on sightings that are, you know, you're on the highway and it runs across the road. Yeah, you're safe, you're in a car, but some people have seen it in the yards. Well, Looking yeah, you're safe, you're in a car, but it's like a moose. You're seeing a moose on the highway, you know, like, if you hit it, you're dead. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, so. Yeah, that'd do some damage. Yeah, so that makes me think that the Sasquatch is probably even bigger and stronger than a moose. Oh, if, yeah. If you're able to hit it with your car, you can, like, really, like, keep moving and... Yeah. Yeah. Even the uh, the female in the Patterson film was seven and a half feet tall, so a lot of males, people have estimated at 10 feet or 11 feet. Wow. Um, heavier than a moose, heavier than a, any big animal that's out there that we know of in North America. But um, really, like dwarfing a grizzly bear, which is huge, but sizable weight. And if I stood on my own shoulders, I would still not be that tall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The strides, the long strides, six foot, six and a half foot strides over a course of um, a quarter mile up a hill. A, a person, even with you can even tell they weren't wooden planks on their feet, but even if it was, there's no way they could carry a six, six and a half foot stride uphill mm -hmm. in the winter. Mm -hmm. it, right. It's just impossible. Right. Yeah. Even the yeah. shack or anyone like that. Interesting. That that's a really yeah. long stride. I know. I'm kinda like I, yeah, like I'm, I'm doing the exact same thing you're doing. I'm trying to like envision like how big is that? <laughs> And, and I mean, like, you, when you think about, um, like, professional football players running up the field, yeah, I mean, they're they're usually taking what a yard, a yard and a half in a stride. Yeah, and, and they're and they're running and stretching. Yeah, right. And and even that's stretch. not six feet. Yeah, no. So what would Somewhere be close uh, to six feet? So no, it would probably be like two of my strides. I'm not that big. I'm only like five eight, five nine, but. It'd be like two of my, two to three of my steps for one of their steps if they were in full stride running. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a few sighting reports where it's just cross the road on one, comes out of the tree, one step on the road and across. Mm -hmm. And they had, uh, I don't know if you're so familiar with Finding Bigfoot TV show. I'm not. I, I don't know. Well, anyways, much. there was a guy I that think I might have seen. Was that on like years and years ago? Yeah, it's still on now. They're showing it again on Animal Planet. Okay, yeah, I might have caught that years ago. Yeah, well, there's a guy that did all the recreations, is uh, James Gray Bobo, and he's a big guy, and it took him two steps to cross, two or three steps across the road, mm -hmm. and the witness was right there, he said, no, this crossed the one bound, one step into the road, and one step into the trees, mm -hmm. so they can cover some ground, their extreme agility is amazing because of their size and weight. Mm -hmm. They've been clocked at uh, 30 to 40 miles an hour. Yeah, they can run. They've they've been seen chasing deer down and catching deer, and a deer can scoop. What? I'm I'm just I'm trying to remember in my own head which animals are known to be able to run like 30 miles an hour. Um, well, a cheetah or something cheetah. like that. Can I, I can think I cheetah? Should be at 60 that? miles an hour. Yeah, uh, che cheetahs are fast, and gazelles. They've been, uh, they've been seen running on all fours. Right. So a cheetah can run fifty to eighty miles an hour. Yes. Yeah, that's right. 
That's fast. Horses. So that's I think uh, that is the fastest fastest animal on land animal. Yeah. So if people wanted to see people in New England say they're into this, they want to see a big hut. Where are the best places around New England one could go? Well, I'd say Central Western Mass, um, New Hampshire, Maine. There's, there's sightings in all these states in New England. Actually, like I said, it's widespread across into New York, Pennsylvania, and especially New York, just an hour north of New York City, the Catskill Mountains. There's been a lot of activity there. There's, there's some great video taken there. They call it the, the baby footage. There's actually a baby in the tree. You can see it swinging around like it's on a trapeze and um, just something a human couldn't do. And now the enhancements, you can see a large body walking along and the little one hops off it into the tree and then it starts. And that was taken by accident. That wasn't a researcher. That was just someone that was shooting video in the parking lot of a concert and um, it was up on the hill watching them. And someone watching the film, uh, I want to say almost 10 years later, noticed it up in the tree. So that's what it took for that. That is, if someone was hoaxing this, why did they wait 10 years? They uh, they didn't know they had it. And someone watching the tape at their house noticed it. And they, what the heck is that? And they kept playing it back and playing it back. And a lot of uh, primate experts now are saying that it definitely can't be a kid or a person. It's either a, a scape tape or it's um, it is it is a Sasquatch buzzing around the tree and like I said they can see it jump off the large object and now they see it swinging around. So, but if you like going back to your question, I don't mean to ramble. Around here in New England, um, Vermont, Vermont, a ton of stuff in Vermont. Any of your uh, hiking trails, the Green Mountains of Vermont, the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Maine is notorious for uh, Mount Katahdin. All northern Maine up into Canada has a really long history. And up there they called, they had different names for it also, all the, all the Native Americans. Uh, Massachusetts, like I said, we've had stuff for the BFRO, um, just last week, a sighting on Mount Tom. The Seven I Sisters. I actually read that. If you go to your Facebook page, you can see the link right to it. Yes. Yep. yep. That was just, that's hot off the press. Like recent to us is uh, months ago. So to get something that happened last week mm -hmm. and two experienced hikers, uh, women that they, they know what they saw. Oh, they didn't see it, but they knew something was following them. Uh, stick snapping, some grunts here and there whooping. Uh, they heard whistling, which is reported a lot. They heard whistling. Um, but it never came out, never bothered them, but they call it paralleling a lot of, which we call it in researchers. They will follow you, literally follow you out, almost guiding you out to make sure you leave. And, um, unless you did something foolish or that's just my opinion too. If, if there's a lot of it's, uh, examples of, if they wanted to cause you harm, they could just come right out and grab you. Mm -hmm. Have and there been any reports of an attack? Really not. Not many that I can think of. There is an old report from the 1920s. A uh, prospector in Canada was zipped up in his sack, and he was carried for hours. He was just picked up. He had no idea where he was. And um, he finally, hours later, was in a cave. And he saw four of these people, the big, the, uh, I keep saying people, I'm sorry, but, um, the man, the, the father, the mother, a younger female and a younger male. And had, I think they had him for like two days. They never bothered him, but they sat around him and examined him and kept looking at him. And, um, I am trying to think how he got away. He gave the thing, uh, he kept coming into the guy's pack, and he gave him anything. All he had left was coffee, a, job, a can of coffee. So he handed it to the thing, and instead of smelling it, the thing just drank the can of coffee. And uh, 
got sick and staggered into the bushes and that was his chance to get up and left. I mean, that's his story. That's his account, but that's been handed down. Uh, third generation of his family still swear to it. And he was a, um, that's just his word. Yeah, that's very cool. So, I mean, if you just Google Bigfoot attack, um, there's books on it. There's articles written on it. There's YouTube videos of people who are, and I, I just did it right now. And so I'm not actually watching any of the videos, but, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, uh, claims out there about different attacks that have happened. And so I don't know if they're as violent necessarily as we would think of an, an yeah. attack being, or if it's more just a, a Bigfoot encounter. But yeah, we would have to actually like dig in and watch those videos. But there was, uh, been a couple like there's where, a lot of it going on out there. There has been a couple where, where I'm not saying it never happens, but it's very rare. Most, you know, eight or nine times out of 10, they see a human, they're going to just take off. Mm -hmm. But there are those cases, um, weird cases. We don't know if it's, um, they could have a brain injury. There could be inbreeding. There's been down in the south. There's a lot of four toed tracks found, which you probably think it's something inbreeding or, and they seem, uh, a totally different attitude. They have a totally different, more fearsome, more, I think more intimidating, more, um, likely to get you the heck out of there in a hurry. Whereas, a lot of other areas, it's just a fleeting glimpse. Mm -hmm. You see, as soon as they know they're seen, they're just gone. How many toes do they usually have? Usually five fingers, five toes. Oh, okay. Designed very much like a human. Hmm. I think, I've always said they're closer to man than any other animal that we do know of, even gorillas and apes. So, um, yeah, it's just mind-boggling that you can't put your finger on it. No one has decided to uh, come forward and because they could like we were saying earlier the ufos they've been these have been seen in the forest fires they've had to put a um put a couple down actually because they were damaged from the fire a couple of them they actually helped and saved and hauled them off there's another report of a um a logging truck hit one in oregon or washington i'm not sure that um you know, all the people that happened that stopped, they all stopped. This thing was in this road. And uh, within minutes, the sheriff was there. And before you know it, there was cars in there. They had it cordoned off. They had all the people off the scene. Even the sheriff couldn't get in there. And a flatbed, oh. a flatbed truck come in with a big top. Something got hauled off. No one ever knew what it was. But the driver saw to it, uh, swore to it that that's what it was. And mm -hmm. Other people that were there on the road that saw it. I mean, too many people saw it. And, but again, that's where they'll say you bring that up. Ah, you're crazy. Uh, it's, it'll always have that stigma of tabloid, trash, um, hoax made up, you name it. Well, you know, like they said in Men in Black, right? Like you, you go to the hot pages, you know, the, the tabloids, they get the information first. Yep. They get yep. the stuff that nobody else really wants to believe and wants to print. Um, but it doesn't make it any less true. Yeah. I think they know there's been, um, even former forestry workers, usually most law enforcement, a lot of law enforcement, well, actually a lot of law enforcement researchers now that they don't really get involved till they retire because it is, it is not good for your job reputation or your mm -hmm. career if you, you know, you're known to be involved in this. So, um, a lot of people keep it on the slide. Don't want to get involved, but there are, I know a lot of former law enforcement government workers that, oh yeah, they're out there. They know, mm -hmm. but they're, they're never going to tell you. So I think it, people would panic. I think you, you know, you wouldn't want to go out and rent the campsite. What's it tomorrow? If you knew these things are in the woods. I know. It, no, yeah. I would not. But in all yeah. fairness, I don't want to rent a campsite anyway. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I'm, I'm more yeah. a, a city stay in a hotel. Yeah. I'll get a little breakfast sort of a little cabin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get a stay dry. As long as you stay dry. <laughs> and and right, bug great. free. So, Beth, do you have any final questions? Oh, let's see. What did I write down here in all of my notes as I went through? Um, so one of the things that I remember hearing about Bigfoots when, when I was little and I was just starting to get involved in a lot of this stuff is that they 
they'll do things like actually to keep people out. Like if you encroach on their, their territory and their land, they'll come back and do things like they rip down the trees and they'll like lay them across the driveway. So you can't drive your car back in. Have you anything? I mean, I know that you said that you've had a couple of different class B um, experiences, um, but have you run into anything like that where something's out of place? Yeah, well, uh, you could actively tell that they were trying to prevent you from coming in. I I haven't personally experienced that, but I know several people have told me that, like, if they're especially if they're in for, there for three or four days, uh, they come out on the way out because sometimes we go in for miles and miles. But um, mm-hmm. I know some people that have they come out. There's a couple logs across the road where you just can't. How did they get there? You know. Right, and because it's clear they didn't just fall, because yep. suddenly, it, and it's not just like one log across the road; it's like a couple it's, of trees have been I ripped think, out and and placed across the road. I think they're sending a message. Yeah. That, um, uh, since the state won't put a gate here, we will. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, like hey, this we we yeah. might we might not have one of those paper titles to this land, but you know, it's ours anyway. Yeah, I think, um, like I said, Amelia was asking all of my questions before I got a chance to answer them. But yeah, I was, mm-hmm. I was really awesome. excited to, to have the chance to talk with you today. Well, thank It'll you so down. much, Dave. This was really cool. And if people want to get involved with Squatchachusetts, should they just go to your Facebook group? Yes, we have a Facebook group. And like I said, we're always willing to take people out or just if they want to follow, you know, what we're doing. Our recent sighting reports are on there, and um, we'll be on there. And people just post fun stuff on there, too. I'm I'm in the group, and I I really like it. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's a fun group. Not so um, stuffy. or You know, we just want people to have fun. You come out with us, Mm -hmm. the funny shirts, the funny, like she said, the swag. Yeah. We'll have, um, because of the virus, we're going to have a big event in October, but obviously not this year. We'll have one next year, Squatch Toberfest. Nice. It'll be a weekend with a lot of the uh, experts in the field and a lot of the scientists' presentations and all kinds of stuff. Well, Let us know. We'll be there. Yeah, so, definitely. We'll usually post or announce if we're going to have an outing. Like I said, this year with the virus, there's not as much, but mm-hmm. with stuff going on, which seems to happen a lot in the fall, late summer and fall, that uh, we're going to try and get out this year. We'll keep social distancing and the good time of year to get out there. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Let us know what you find. And we really, really, really appreciate you coming on to the show. Thanks so much. It was so great to meet you. You too, Amelia. You too, Beth. Yeah, no, this was really great. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. Anytime. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Enjoy enjoy your Labor Day. Bye-bye. Thank you. You too. Wow, that was so much fun. Thank you so much again to Dave McCullough. That was awesome and a lot of fun. Who knew that there were so many Bigfoot sightings around here? I, When you had originally suggested that we have, and I, of course, have written them down as Sasquatchachusetts, but that is incorrect. It is Squatchachusetts. Squatchachusetts. Squatchachusetts, which is surprisingly difficult to say. Um yes. I was like, how how many Bigfoot are really in Massachusetts? Because that, I wasn't serious. I wasn't, I wasn't serious. I wasn't kidding when I was like, you know, well, you think of Sasquatch, you think of like Montana, like the northwestern part of the United States and, you know, up into like BC in Canada, the BC in Canada, um, like Alberta, like the western Canada region, because there's so many forests out there. Um, yeah, I never thought about there being a Bigfoot in you know, uh, Springfield. Yeah. But yeah, wow. that, that report that just got put on the uh, Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, the BFRO, was from August 30th or 31st. So like four days ago from when we're recording this. Wild stuff. I know. Crazy. But we found, uh, we didn't find, we got a lot of reviews and a lot of stories this week. Woohoo! Yay. Which one do you want to start with? Uh, let's do reviews first. All right. Let's hear what people love about us first. Curtis, <laughs> 10 of 10. You can give I, us 10 stars? Wait no, a that's what, no, that's his screen name, Curtis, 10 of 10. Oh, okay. I found your podcast recently and couldn't be happier. I love ghost stories and I love New England. 
us too. I enjoy hearing your stories and your experiences, and it makes me miss my trips to New England. We have some great ghosts here in Florida, but no one can beat New England for its ghostly atmosphere. Thanks for the fantastic show. Well, thank you, Curtis 10 of 10. That is very encouraging. Thank you, Curtis 10 of 10. And I think that you're right. There is nothing quite as spooky as those autumn evenings right after the sun goes down where maybe you can see a little mist rising, but it's still warm enough that you can go out, but maybe cool enough that you'd like to have a sweater or a fire going. But yeah, those are those are definitely some spooky nights. Don't shake your head at me. Don't what shake you your head. What are talking about? <laughs> I'm talking about autumn. I am so happy that it's fall. I, just, I am. I mean, too. No, yeah. okay. And it was too hot today, and I, I just needed to be cool already. Next up. Next, we have one on Facebook from Kristen McBride. Did you know I, that you could leave us reviews on Facebook? You can leave us reviews anywhere. And, and anywhere. we will actually find most of them. Amelia goes out of her way to go around and search down who's talking about us. I just, I need so much attention and, like... <laughs> people saying nice things about me and I don't always get that at work and I need it from the podcast. <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> I have passed my love of all things ghostly and bump in the night on to my daughters who are seven and 11. We love watching shows and listening to stories about ghosts. We happened across this podcast recently and it is our go-to now. We are often in the car driving from activity to activity in this fun and informative way to share our common interest. I also love that it's not so scary that I'm woken in the middle of the night by a seven-year-old with nightmares. My kids love the banter between you guys, and we love all the adventures you share. Great job. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. That is really, really nice. And hello to your daughters. Hi, girls. So, Kristen McBride, I have to tell you that this, like, has, like, made my life. Um, that my, okay. So I have to back up a little bit because when I was a kid, I was like seven or eight years old and I started to get really interested in paranormal stuff. Um, I was really into the idea of, uh, UFOs and aliens, um, the idea about, uh, ESP and different, like, telepathies. Uh, I, I was, like, obsessed with it. And so the idea that Amelia and I started this goofy little podcast to talk about ghost stories and your kids are the same age that I was, that I got so interested in this. And we are now able to pass, you know, our shared uh, enjoyment of all the stuff paranormal onto your young people. I am just like so amazingly thrilled. And I think that this, it goes to, um, you're not the first person who's written in that's been like, hey, you know, there, there are kids listening here. And I just absolutely love that. I, Amelia, I love that we have like kids that listen to us because. Yeah, we're really great. <laughs> I mean, we are, but even more than that, like it's, it's just something that, you know, I mean, obviously with, with social media and all the stuff, like people can get their information in a lot of places now. I was only able to get my paranormal information from, you know, books when I was little, but like this, I just am so happy to be able to pass this on to a new generation of people who can also enjoy it as much as we do. New generation of spooky chicks. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So in in response to our pleas for more of your drive-by ghostings, we were lucky enough to get one from Deanne that's called a flyby ghosting. Hi, guys. And I think by that she means girls. Hi. Hi. You asked if anyone had footage of a flyby ghosting. Well, here you go. This is a clip from a nine-minute video. In the video, at least a dozen cars pass by, and never once do you see anything until I physically walk up to the window. And when I looked up after pulling the post back, because I didn't want any reflections, I saw a beam of light come down my lawn before it flashed in the window. I have the original footage to compare. I set it up and walked away, and I only went back to move the fence post. I'll also include another light anomaly and watch the center window of the second clip. So she sent us two clips, one from YouTube and one is an actual clip that she emailed us. So the first one is called Ghostly Light Show, and that you can find this one on YouTube. So let me tell you really quick what it looks like. It's only four seconds long. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't see it. So if you see it, do you want to describe it? I, just, I don't see anything happen. There's like a little sure. like spinny thing going on, but. Okay, so the first one's just in like a dining room area, and you can see the reflection in the window, and you can see um, an overhead fan. And then there's this, if you watch carefully, you have to be careful. It's almost as if this light goes from the bottom of the window up in like a half moon shape to the other side. Now, I'm not sure what this is. I can't tell. This to me, I, um, you know, it, it could be anything, right? But it, it is strange. And then the second one, Beth, do you want to describe this one? Sure. So the second one is a clip that's about 14 seconds long, and you see uh, who I assume is Deanne. She goes over in front of the window, and it's almost moving in slow motion, but there's a light outside the window, and you see a car drive by, and then a light comes, like, rushing up the front of her lawn, and it, like, peeks right in the window on the left. And then it disappears. It takes maybe a second and a half, and it's right toward the end of the clip. But there's, I mean, I, I can watch it again real quick. But again, and actually, if if you look at the drapes in that one, you can see something kind of like floating around the drapes as well. Oh yeah, that's true. There is like a little orb that floats from right to left across the screen, pretty much right before the yes. light comes rushing up from the yard. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they're they're pretty cool videos. So um. Thank you so much, Deanne, for sending those. Yes, thank you. Okay, so now we switch over to Facebook for our next spooky tale, which is from Mike. Hey, Mike. Mike and I hey, are Mike. Facebook friends, too. Add me on Facebook, everyone. This is an experience I once had at a cemetery. A little bit of background on me. I never drank alcoholic beverages until I was 22 years old. I was in a strict religious sect. And so I had never experienced being drunk at the time this happened. A friend and I were visiting our mutual friend in a town just a few hours from our own. The three of us decided to walk around in a cemetery around 10 or 11 p.m. We told the obligatory ghost stories, then began looking around on our own, slowly wandering away from each other into the darkness. I have always tried my best to avoid stepping on graves and buried folks, and so I was walking very slowly, mostly making my way around by feeling in the dark. When I was making my way, I came upon an area that seemed no different from the rest of the cemetery, but definitely made me feel different. I instantly felt flushed and warm, and my brain slowed down as if my thoughts were suddenly clouded. The few silhouettes around me that I could make out seemed to spin, making me feel dizzy, and I started feeling nauseous. I also lost my balance, and remember distinctly being concerned I might stumble and step on a grave. I got back to the pathway as soon as I could. Just as instantaneously, I felt the strange sensations come on. They melted away the very second I stepped out of the area. Well, I was quite spooked now, so I rushed back to my friends, and we left shortly after. I was... It was only later in life, when I got drunk for the very first time, that I realized that all the sensations I experienced coincided with the way I felt at two in the morning, at the close of a Friday bender. The stagger, the flushed hot face, and the slogging thoughts, even the spins. Sincerely, Kosher Leviathan. Wow. Thanks for sending that. That was awesome. Yeah. Okay, so we have one more. All right, so this is another one that came in through email, and this is from Joe. Ooh, Joe's not Joe's not a scary name. Spooky. I don't think there are any scary names. Well, I was joking Agatha. about Joe. Agatha. Agatha is very spooky. I think so. Yeah, I, I think that if I if I were to meet someone in person named Agatha, I'm sure they would be a lovely, lovely individual. But secretly, in the back of my mind, I would be waiting for them to put a hex on me. Okay, so this one's from Joe. Hey, Joe. Hey, Joe. Dear Ghost Hunters, I love your podcast and wanted to share my most memorable ghost sighting. I grew up on the Cape in Katuit in a house that was haunted, but that's not where I saw this spirit. I was 11 or 12 at the time, and my family was at a cranberry bog off Newton Road. We would all hang out near the pond while water skiing. 
Any time we would spend the day at this bog, my father or one of my uncles would find stone arrowheads in the sand. On one particular Saturday, someone told me to look and pointed across the bog. There, in the middle of the day, on the far side of the bog, was a Native American on horseback riding down the dirt road. Clear as day, I can remember the horse, the colorful blanket draped across its back and as a saddle, and the shirtless Native wearing a feathered headdress. At the time, it was fascinating that someone would be riding around dressed like that. I tried to get someone's attention. I can't remember who it was, but I looked away for a second, and when I looked back, the rider was gone. Hmm. I remember going around the bog in an attempt to find where he had gone. There was a path that led off the side of the bog, but it was a hundred yards or so where the rider was when he vanished. No way he could have made it in the time I had looked away. Thanks for taking the time to read my story, Joe. Good story, Joe. That is a really good story. That uh, was very good. I mean, a, a full apparition and not only of a, a humanoid, but also a, a horse like full color and everything that well and that was the other thing i was really thinking about is like if it's a person and they slink away maybe you saw it maybe you didn't right maybe maybe the person slunk away a horse is not going to slink away <laughs> like you're not gonna not hear the horse right it's like where where did it come from where did it go to i feel like i should have sang that actually um so i then- know i was gonna say because his name's joe where did you come from? Where did you go? Where did you come from? Cotton Eye Joe. I had no idea that's what the words of that were. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, but like to, to have the horse there. Also, Joe, I'm just going to say, I think it's a bit of a tease to tell us that you grew up in a haunted house and not tell us the haunted house stories. More stories, more stories, more yeah, stories. So we're going to start an online petition for Joe to send us his stories from his house. Um, please, Joe, send us your stories from your house. Please record yourself telling one of your stories and send it in to us. Make it anybody an else MP3, has stories. MP3 format under three minutes. If anybody else has stories, they can send them via MP3 format. Keep it under three minutes. Email it to ghosthuntinginnewengland at gmail.com. And we will be happy to play your voice. Daniel in Australia, I'm looking at you. Yeah, Even though I can't see you right now in my mind's eye, I'm looking at you all the way in Australia saying, why haven't we... We're like halfway through season three here, and we have no Daniel stories. All right. Well. Calling you out. So our social media, you can find us online at ghosthuntinginnewengland.com, facebook.com backslash ghosthuntinginnewengland, on Instagram at ghosthuntinginnewengland, Twitter, ghost hunting, N E. Let's get those Twitter followers up, people. As always, uh, send us a message. Reach out. Oh, and five star reviews, please. We need some more. Please, 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 please feed my ego. We need some five star reviews. So don't send us four stars. Don't send us three stars. I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna put words on the other options because I don't want it to manifest. Please. Wait, five wait, stars. wait. Like shirtless pictures? No, no shirtless pictures. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's it. I hope everyone has a great rest of their Wednesday. We will see you next week. Uh, oh, we got a really cool episode next week, but we're going to keep it on hush hush. So, uh, yeah, tune in next week. And as always, happy hunting. Mm-hmm.